This episode takes two lies and a truth to a whole nother level. Hey loves, it's A back on your screen with another one. I hope you're all well. Today we're discussing Atlanta season four, episode eight, The Goose That Sat Next to the Door. What a title. Everything about this episode from start to finish, every single sentence, every single scene, every single second could be analyzed and something could be taken away, but we'd be here all day. So I need your help. Let me know what you took away down below and let's get into this episode. As per usual, we're going to break down the plot as well as some theories and themes. The first thing that stood out to me is the BAN. This is a throwback to season one and one of my favorite episodes, you know, when Paperboy was on Montague. I fell out and my favorite part about that episode were the commercials. So we missed those, but they made up for it with their commentary on the culture and the what ifs. There were so many what if moments in this episode. The way that they fuse fact and fiction, perfection. I was sitting over here and I know I'm not the only one thinking, wait, is this real? No, no, this can't be real. But then also thinking half the times when Atlanta shows us something, we're like, nah, it is. And when they show us something, we're like, ah, okay, it isn't. So I'm laughing so hard halfway through when I realized this whole thing is a spoof. They need an Emmy. This has to be hands down the best mockumentary ever made. <laughs> Each and every week, at least in season four, Atlanta outdoes itself. This one is a certified classic five out of five. Can we all agree that Atlanta has created something that we've never seen before? This is super meta. How can you make commentary on Disney when your show is by proxy put on the platform. And you're making up this fictitious story about Disney that could be true. If you know anything about Walt Disney's early beginning and their menstrual cartoons, I remember finding that out in an elective class I took first or second year. Oh man, that film class showed me a lot of things I wish I could unsee. One of them being how they used to make mockery of black people. Fun fact, if you didn't know about watermelon back in the day, they stigmatized it because black people were using it to commodify and elevate becoming entrepreneurs for it. And they didn't want them to have upward mobility. So they made this thing about it being lackadaisical and lazy and all black people do with their big lips is yam watermelon. It's crazy when you find out the history of what a stereotype is and how this show and this episode really speaks to stereotypes and what is blackness. This also ties and layers and levels in to the commentary that we've heard Donald Glover share before. As per him, as an actor, as him, as a musician, Childish Gambino, there's always been this question to what is blackness. When they brought up in the mockumentary that Thomas's blackness was questioned because he was an animator, instantly thought of Donald Glover. Why is it certain professions are not black or people don't speak black? And who gets to be the gatekeeper of blackness? As we discussed last season with the Kevin Samuels episode, they keep bringing back that as a reoccurring theme. So as we go through this mockumentary, we see a lot of tropes, the way his mom said, protest with your pen and how he decides to make this unapologetic black movie. I almost believe it, but then when I got my Googles on, I realized that the screenwriter and the story writers, none of them were black. So I don't know if that's just a thing that the internet made up that Goofy is black, but it could be true. That's the craziest thing about everything said. It could be true. Two lies and a truth. Hardest game ever played. A couple highlights of this episode is when they had Thomas's son, Max, who was supposed to be the muse for Maximilian in the Goofy movie, speak on how his dad changed and shift and also the ex-wife and the mom and all these people as well as people he worked with. And there's this shift from being the nerd, the animator to being the leader and the boss and how he almost perpetuates some of the microaggressions he would have experienced. Even the title of this, plays into the idea of EDI, equity, diversion, inclusion, the goof that sat next to the door. The only reason why he got voted was a mix up between Thomas and Thompson. <laughs> I thought that could have been real, but it wasn't. And when he was posted up posing on top of the table, I said, that's swag. <laughs> the part that had me laughing the most is the poor student comes into his class with the crutches. You gotta beat a man down when he's already down. Really, you have to talk about how he said the wrong thing at the cookout and the next scene is him, you, you move our legs like this and the animator recounting he had to keep drawing daps until his fingers bled. <laughs> They're so extra. This is why I love Atlanta. It's so ridiculous, but it's so real at the same time. They did a very good job of tying what was happening at the time. 
So at the beginning, they were talking about the 92 riots and they also talked about the OJ Simpson trial. Now Washington, who elevated by accident, was transcending some of the blackness while trying to represent it and that's what consumed him. Even that last scene of him drinking and talking to the camera, I said, you guys really did the most with this one. I think that symbolized how artists sometimes are consumed by their art, the pressure to perform, to conform, but also wanna create something that stands the test of time because it matters and it's bigger than you. I read so much in that scene. I don't know if I was supposed to, but that's what I saw. There were so many themes of a seat at the table of respect of black masculinity, even when they spoke at the polarity of either the man shooting the other guy or the, it's not queer baiting, but when they were mocking what it would be like to be queer and how there was no in between of a father doing what a father's supposed to do, even if it was out of fear, never took it in as a child. Watching this episode brought it back to me. The whole reason why Goofy snatched up Max when he was supposed to try to impress Roxanne was because he was worried about his son being put in the electric chair. Oh, that's about the fear of a father trying to do right by his son, but also protect him. And if, if Goofy is black, I mean, that's a lot of conversations to be had about how to act when you get stopped at a light. Even though this might have been more commentary on Rodney King at the time, it still parallels to George Floyd and those between and after. So much to say my mind is exploding. You guys are going to have to help me by adding things down below that I know I missed. I can't possibly cover all of it. A couple more things I want to share with you guys before I hop off. I was blown away by how they were able to just smoothly put in things like Le Petit Prince, the little prince, and it was an <laughs> animation of prince. I like, you really did that? I was laughing so hard because if you know the story about the little prince, it's a French novel. I'm pretty sure it's like second grade reading level, but I was reading it in grade 11. Some of the themes in that book were so deep and heavy. The ideas about loneliness and love and longing and a child's innocence to see the world in a different way. And that ties in perfectly with what a goofy movie was, what it represents to us as millennials, and also with Lana. Everything about this episode just intertwined on so many levels. Even when there was the picture of Thompson with his family, they're all wearing the goofy hat, it pulled me back to new jazz when Lorraine, who is the embodiment of Paperboy's past mother, puts the goofy hat on him to make him blend in. Was that speaking more to him being goofy or his blackness and the stereotypes that Paperboy has to adhere to as a rapper? Everything is coming full circle now and you can read it and tie it and tether it in wherever you want. Donald Glover should open a school because the way he schools us is unparalleled. I didn't know there was animators that do the in-between and some of the history that was actually true about Disney and how they conducted themselves. I was like, wait, what? Are you serious? And even the quote about the good-natured colored boy for the idea of what Goofy is supposed to be, which is so mind-blowing to me. I also didn't know that Bobby Brown was initially supposed to vocalize Powerline. I love that song growing up. Brian McKnight's hidden gem. We love Tevin Campbell over here. So I was falling out when they got the re of Brian McKnight. Max in that scene is really giving Bobby Brown energy. And I love that song. And eye to eye, oh, bringing back all the nostalgia tease for me. I'm sure you, you were reliving your childhood. That's kind of the reason why I only watched this episode one time. I watched it last night and yesterday was two years since my dad passed away. So this was heavy. The movie showed single fatherhood, but also could be a different perspective of what it's like to be a black father or just the beauty of familyhood and maybe the not so good ending that Thomas got. It also went off the waterfalls, right? So really, art imitating life or life imitating art. Just everything about it, even the end credits with all the scenes from the movie and the music. I loved it, everything from start to finish. What stood out to me? Oh, the part where they said he wanted to write in the plot that at the end, Goofy gets got. I said, that was just over the top. Not for a kid's movie, not ever. And how they wrote in Bigfoot instead of doing his Huey on the throne. That's disrespectful. <laughs> <laughs> so much could be said and for once I have no words like I'm trying to put together all the breakdowns but it's just so mind-blowing that I just 
I don't have it in me. I'm going to need your help, guys. So leave it down below. Also, I'm going to put some questions in the comment section. Until next time, stay safe, stay sane, stay blessed. Love and later.